Assalamu alaikum everyone. Assalamu alaikum brother Parvez. And Sheikh Ismail and Sister Sajida. Assalamu alaikum. Sidecraft level cat stand. Walaikum assalam. Walaikum assalam. Brother Pervez, how are you? Alhamdulillah. Uh, Imam Siraj said he tried to join and uh, he was having issues. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Like he was not letting him in. So I shared contact with you. Can and I also something? shared contact with Vicar Brandy. I'm not sure she's having issues either. I believe the reason probably they were not able to join because the meeting had not started yet. But now that the meeting is started, um, if they attempt to join, inshallah, they shouldn't have any problem. Yeah, I'll tell them. Exactly. Assalamu alaikum, Imam Safwan. Welcome. Waalaikum salam wa rahmatullah. How are you, sir? Alhamdulillah. How are you? I'm doing good, my friend. Alhamdulillah. Wa sha Allah. Happy to join. Kafahal, Ustad. Assalamu alaikum, Sidi Parvez. How are you, sir? Alhamdulillah, sir. Wa sha Nice to see you. Always nice to see you. Alhamdulillah, nice to see you as well. Alhamdulillah. Salaamu alaikum, Iman Safwan. Salaamu alaikum, Sister Sajda. How are you? I'm doing well, Alhamdulillah. This is our first encounter. Welcome to the community. We are so excited to have you. Uh, inshallah, if there's anything that we can do to support your, your process and helping us as a community grow and be better, please, by all means, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we are all here to support you, support us, support you. It's, it's cyclical, so inshallah. <laughs> yeah, inshallah, inshallah. Uh, I'm, everything is a surprise to me as of now. So we'll see what happens and uh, I'll let you know as I go, I guess. <laughs> okay, inshallah. <laughs> We welcome Randy also. Hello. Hello, Vicar. Randy, how are you? This is Paul. Hi, how are welcome. you? Welcome to the panel. Hi, Vicar. Brandy, so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. 
Hi, thank you. It's nice to meet you too. Brother Perez, I'm uh, assuming we're just waiting for one more panelist. Uh, Imam yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, um, we have three of the pan. We have we have enough of the panelists here. Uh, I'm sure we'll find a way to connect with uh, Imam Siraj along the way. So I guess in the interest of time, perhaps we could have Sheikh Ismail uh, get going. But from here on, Sister Sajda is driving so i'm just uh an observer this is subject uh the 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 floor is yours the mic is yours please we'll go with shake smile and then i presume we call brandy um or imam safwan whoever wants to go first and then imam siraj will come up to that by then inshallah sounds good inshallah Assalamu alaikum community thank you so much for joining us um we are honored to um, have our, our Juneteenth program. This is a celebration of the triumphs and the struggles that we as an American community have gone through, specifically the African-American community. Um, as, you, as you may or may not know, um, our, our struggles as an American community have been vast, right? So we have, you know, an amalgamation of many, many, many different folks um, that have come to America, that have been brought to America. Um, and part of our struggles involve our efforts to make freedom universal, to make liberation universal, to support each other in you know, our efforts to, uh, to, to, to uh, rally against anything that may be oppressive. Um, and so, you know, we want to support opportunities for liberation as much as possible. So we welcome you to our program this evening we'll be, where we'll, we will be discussing that more. Um, but before we begin, inshallah, I would welcome Sheikh Ismail Issa, one of our longstanding, um, our longstanding community imams who, you know, is kind enough to give us the most beautiful recitation. Um, please open us up with whatever it is that your heart is so inclined to recite. We look forward to hearing it. Sheikh Ismail, the floor is yours. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu kunu qawwameen bil qisti shuhada lillahi wa law ala anfusikum. Kunu qawwameen bil qisti shuhada lillahi wa law ala anfusikum awil walidayn wal aqrabin. إيكن غنيا أو فقيرا فالله أولى بهما فلا تتبعوا الهوى أن تعدلوا وإن تلو أو تعرضوا فإن الله كان بما تعملون خبيرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قوامين لله شهداء بالحسط ولا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم على ألا تعدلوا يعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى واتقوا الله واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا 
وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير صدق الله العظيم Thank you so much, Sheikh Ismail. I'm always so moved by your recitation. Alhamdulillah. I'm so I'm always so grateful to hear it. I don't get to hear it nearly as much as we used to when we were in person. Um, so I always just look forward to hearing it electronically. However, I can get it, I'm just grateful. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> um, so thank you all for, for joining us tonight. We are here discussing social justice. Um, we are doing this at this time um, because this is right around the time that specifically the African-American community celebrates um, what's known as Juneteenth. Um, so for, for those who may not be aware of what Juneteenth is, um, I, let me just explain just a little bit. So basically it goes by a lot of names. It could be called Emancipation Day. It could be called Freedom Day. Um, or the country's second independence day. Um, Juneteenth is one of the most Im important anniversaries in our nation's history. On June 19th in 1865, Major General Gordon Granger, who had fought for the Union, led a force of soldiers to Galveston, Texas to deliver a very important message. The war was finally over. The Union had won and it now had the manpower to enforce the end of slavery. The announcement came two months after the effective conclusion of the Civil War and even longer since Abraham Lincoln had first signed the Emancipation Proclamation. But many enslaved Black people in Texas still weren't free even after that day. So that was a long, 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 long time ago. Um, but our efforts to um, support freedom, support justice, support um, those things that um, encourage social equality um, continue, right? It hasn't, it hasn't finished. It's not like, oh, we did that, we're done, right? We're still working on it. There are still so many areas that we need to and um, that we need to and we will continue to need to, to support. Um, and in our efforts to support social justice and to approach it from um, many different angles and many different sides. Uh, we want to recognize that, you know, we as an American society have so many different facets, right? So many, so many different areas to work on. Um, and this is, this is all a part of it. So um, we'd like to, you know, invite you as our community to join us tonight to discuss that a little bit, um, a little bit more in depth. As I, um, as I begin the evening, I would, sincerely like to invite, um, I would sincerely like to invite Vicar Brandy Hebert. Am I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Please correct me if I didn't. Um, Vicar Brandy Hebert is a senior master of divinity student at United Lutheran Seminary seeking ordination in the ELCA through the New Jersey Synod candidacy process. She resides in Princeton Junction, New Jersey with her husband of 15 years, Noel, a financial analyst and their two children, 13 year old twins, Ge Gehrig, Gehrig and Eliana. Please correct me if I you know, messed up any names. I apologize sincerely. Brandy graduated from the University of Texas at Austin in 1994 and had a 10 year career in the theater before transitioning to a sales career in the building materials industry. She has lived in Ohio, Texas, many, many, many different states, right? So Ohio, Texas, Illinois, Kentucky, and New York before relocating to New Jersey in 2007. As a stay at home mother, while her children were young, she was president of her children's PTA and active in multiple ministry, ministries at Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, including participating in council spiritual formation committee and teaching Sunday school. During this time, Brandy began discerning God's call deeper into ministry. Vicar Brandy, thank you so much for joining us. 
I am so honored to have you here this evening as we discuss social justice and what that looks like in this day and age. We understand that you know this is certainly an ever-changing, ever-growing effort on our part as you know community members, as believers in God, as those who you know seek to enjoin good and forbid what is wrong. Um, now that we have you here, I would like to ask you, what is your what is your belief in terms of how we as community members, regardless of faith, can approach social justice? What is the area that you feel like we need to sort of attack most and in what ways can we do that? All right, thank you. And thank you for the introduction. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's a, an honor to be here with y'all tonight to discuss this important topic. <clears throat> and and you ask a very big question, so. <laughs> so look, uh, hey, just take what you can chew, chomp on whatever is okay. manageable. <laughs> all right, all right. So um, I'll take a stab at it here. <clears throat> so one of my favorite books is a book called A New Religious America by Diana Eck, a Harvard professor. Uh, she did three years of research and was getting ready to publish this book right before 9-11 happened. Um, the book was then put, uh, on hold, she rewrote the beginning of the section so that she could respond in real time to the attacks that were happening um, post 9-11, um, targeting the Muslim community, um, but actually um, the attacks, many of the attacks were, were uh, not only in the Muslim community, but it were targeting Sikhs uh, because many Americans could not tell the difference. They didn't know. And um, certainly you could, point to a number of reasons for that <clears throat> in terms of like mainstream media and um, Hollywood tropes and things like that. But her argument in this book <clears throat> is that the greatest challenge the United States faces in the 21st century is to learn to embrace visible difference. And I think that that is the most important challenge that certainly the um, ELCA in partnership with um, our multi-faith siblings of God need to work together to address to bridge those differences. Um, Professor Eck addresses that from um, a multi-religious standpoint, um, but I certainly think that dismantling white supremacy falls under um, that need to learn to embrace visible difference. Um, in the ELCA, uh, uh, which is, you know, the 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 Lutheran tradition, theological tradition that kind of under um, uh, provides a foundation for my perspective on this work, uh, approaches it from two different pillars. One would be um, a social service and the other would be social advocacy. Uh, so social service is, you know, more of providing that direct human assistance, whether it's um, putting food on people's plates or um, clothes on their backs. But the, the, the social advocacy piece, I think, is equally important. You don't do one without the other. And the social advocacy piece is that part of changing the actual social structures, policies, and working to enact legislation that's going to provide a more just um, society so that people can put food on their plates and people can put food clothes on their backs. And so you don't do one without the other. It's a both and. Um, and a number of um, particular initiatives that the ELCA has taken on in the last three years is a concerted effort to um, address the educational piece of anti-racism and provide resources so that the congregations can do that and can create open opportunities for civic dialogue on these issues, inviting their multi-faith partners from other communities. Um, I mentioned Diana Eck earlier, and she has the Pluralism Project, which is a wonderful um, online resources with some tremendous resources that can be shared. And so those pieces, like, like events like this evening, are, are wonderful because it allows people to then engage one another and become more comfortable with multi-faith dialoguing on what can be difficult and uncomfortable conversation topics. Um, so I think that that's certainly a start. But the other piece would be cert would be um, exploring the possibilities together to really engage in that legislative ag advocacy piece to work to dismantle, say, you know, um, redlining practices or um, unfair um, banking practices or taking on the you know prison industrial complex and mass incarceration that disproportionately incarcerates. 
um, black and brown um, bodies in this country. And so there are some key legislative pieces that the multi-faith communities can come together in partnership with NGOs to really kind of create change both in the social advocacy piece as well as the other piece of the social service, which I think we see um, certainly being addressed in our community here in you know, the West Windsor Plainsboro area. So, you know, you addressed that really well. <laughs> you said it was really big and then you handled it really, really well. So, <laughs> so thank you for taking it on <laughs> well, you know, fearlessly. We're just... <laughs> We're just scratching the surface and it's easier said than done, right? Yes. So I think the key piece is when we, we, we have these wonderful events that y'all are hosting and you create this great webinar is then what are our action steps to follow up? You know, how can we meet in small groups afterwards on an ongoing basis so we can come together? Because one of the challenges right now in this country seems that we have the incapacity to have deliberate dialogue, right? We want to either discuss, but then there's no action or we want to debate and we just become increasingly polarized, right. right? So we're trying to find what's that middle piece where we can, things that we can agree on for actionable change. And I think that that really is the bigger question that takes a lot of prayer and discernment. Absolutely. And you know, that's so funny. We have this phrase in my family called analysis paralysis. It's literally like it's like, what are we, you know, if, if we're planning a family event, like, what are we, what, where are we going? Which park are we going to go to for the barbecue? And it's for two hours, we're just debating which park. It's just this analysis paralysis that sort of stops us from taking any action. So absolutely, I would agree with you. There are two areas that we certainly, you know, we're kind of either just talking about it so much and not really focusing on, you know, that aspect of following through with action. And we forget about how important that action is. Um, so, you know, I certainly would agree with you. Um, I, I, would, I would like to ask a follow-up question if you don't mind, um, especially reading your, your bio. Um, I'm also a mother, I'm also a stay-at-home mom. And so I find that um, teaching my children, especially since we've been home so frequently, right? With COVID and everything, teaching my, my children about empathy um, and about differences is an area of focus that I've had to pay almost more attention to because they're less exposed to, you know, more of a variety of people. It's literally just our family, right? So we're sort of, even within our family, of course we have differences, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself paying more attention to that. Um, what would you say, you know, how would you advise a parent who's, you know, um, trying to encourage their, their child in, in areas of social justice? And I'm saying social justice in quotes because at, you know, at young ages, it, it may not necessarily be social justice. It may just be standing up for someone who's being bullied. It may just be, you know, like mm -hmm. in terms of having, um, you know, respectful interactions with your siblings. So, you know, at the young ages, it's very, it's not quite social justice, but that's where it begins, right? What would you say to those of us who are parents who are trying to, to raise um, loving, empathetic, caring, kind, gentle children who also are able to stand up for themselves and also are able to stand up for each other? That's probably even a harder question, right? <laughs> Because parenting is the most challenging thing I think I have ever done in my life as the mother of now two 14 year olds. <clears throat> and, um, and COVID certainly has made it even more so challenging, right? With this isolation and now we're all kind of coming out and then how do you deal with all of the complexities of that the world has now thrust upon us and what was already a complex world. Um, but since um, we're, 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 and I know with the smaller children, it's, it's still, we're, we're not there yet, right? I mean, I still, there's just so much that is, is challenging to do. Um, but with the younger ones, even that, that, that piece about um, learning to embrace visible difference that Diana talks about, I really just can't push this book enough. It's really wonderful. See, I got a copy here. Um, <clears throat> One of the things they did in that research is she stepped out of her comfort zone and she worshiped with people of different religions. She worshiped with people who looked different from her. And she took a cohort of fairly diverse students with her and they, they, they gathered together and broke bread at different places. And one of the things I think you can do with your children is introduce them to a wide variety of cuisines, introduce them to a wide variety of cultural experiences and dance. And, and you know, if you're not ready to, to kind of step outside of that, 
um, you know, the cocoon that we're trying to build around our families to keep them safe during this time. There's certainly a multitude of those opportunities online and have those conversations. Um, and the, as people of faith, um, I think one of the things that's a gift is that our faith underscores that belief of, of embracing our neighbor and um, loving our neighbor of ourself. And I'm certainly speaking from the Christian tradition, but I believe that's something that we all share, um, that kind of golden rule. And um, um, in incorporating that into the conversation intentionally with your children so that they connect those experiences with that. Right. That's why that's why we do what we do, um, as well as, you know, the enjoyment of the tremendous diversity of God's creation that is reflected in all of us. So um, certainly for the littlest ones, that's the beginning. And then I would argue that it is never too early. Your children are never too young to begin to have um, conversations about race and the complexity of race in this country. And there are a tremendous number of resources out there. Um, that I could certainly, you know, forward and it can be posted and shared um, books and podcasts and, and things to, to read to your children, even the littlest ones, um, to get started early. Um, and I say that as, um, you know, a, a person with white privilege and speaking to people in, in that from that point of view. Um, but <clears throat> uh, it's certainly an opportunity to kind of engage as a whole as we see the demographics of this nation shifting and continue to shift. Um, tremendously as we kind of head into the middle of the, the 21st century. So those would be some of the things that we, we do and have done. And then I would encourage other parents to continue to do. And I, while acknowledging that COVID has made it, you know, quite complex to step outside of our homes. Yet again, I'm, I'm tossing them to you and you're just knocking them out the park. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I, I didn't want to make it, you know, too difficult on you, but I certainly have questions. So I didn't want to shy away from the questions that I had there. And hopefully, you know, I, I hope our audience is finding it as informative as I am. Um, so certainly thank you so much for for sharing your point of view and, and coming here, you know, as you are just a you know, a part of our interfaith community. Um, we very much appreciate this type of dialogue. Um, and so, you know, I, I do thank you very much for that and for bearing with me as I ask you these huge questions. <laughs> um, so I have another question and actually um, I have a question um, that's coming from one of the members of our community who actually sort of built this community. Um, uh, the question is regarding our efforts or initiatives um, with respect to social, social justice um, being beyond just the US. Um, how do we address social justice initiatives on a, on a universal scale, on a global scale? Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and I, this question was posed to all of the panelists. So I'm going to put it out there for anyone who would like to respond. Um, but I will say, Imam Safwan, you're, you're, I'm, you're on my list. <laughs> you're coming up next. <laughs> anyone who would like to respond, respond to that um, in terms of you know, our, our social justice efforts just to be here in the US or should they be more global and what that looks like? All right, Imam Safwan, your go. Oh, I come. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bakar, uh, for that wonderful talk. And thank you so much, uh, Sajda, uh, for moderating and asking the hard questions, mashallah. Can everyone hear me okay? Just to make sure. Okay, perfect. Um, should I, should I answer um our beloved Tahir's uh question first or should i are you going to ask me questions as well or should i you know i did talk? have a question for you but it's okay i want you to answer um brother Tahir's question i think it's a, a brilliant question and i'm glad he raised it so um you know i certainly this time i as an african african-american i'm thinking sort of in a sense, one track minded, but it's a brilliant question. And I, you know, I, I welcome the exploration of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's kind of part of my talk, what I have 
prepared, I guess. Um, but I would like to hear your question and then I will address both of them at the same time. Uh -huh, okay. That's okay. Fair enough. Also, um, I believe Imam Saraj Wahaj is in the virtual building. Oh, alhamdulillah. So, <laughs> in the virtual uh, building. So out of out of respect to our teachers as well, if, if he would go before me, I would appreciate that as well. Imam Siraj, did you want to respond um, regarding the question about social justice on the larger scale? Um, what does that look like for us, specifically as uh, believers, people who believe in one God? What does it look like for us to pursue social justice on a global scale? Um, you know, I'm at a disadvantage. I just got on. I've been trying to get on for the last half an hour, and you guys wouldn't let me on. So I have no idea what we're doing right now. But you know, and so let me let me sketch my breath. Let me see what you're doing. Um, my participation. What you want me to do? Um, how long you want me to take? See, there's a lot of as a million questions I have. I can I can probably answer your questions, inshallah. But I want to just kind of see what's going on because. You got me at a loss right now. Okay, Imam. I, first of all, I apologize for the technical difficulties and also for putting you on the spot like that. Go ahead and take a minute. I yeah. was calling them. I, was, I kept calling and said, what's going on? They said the, the same thing. It was technical difficulties. And I fight. So I said, you know what? Allah want me to make my prayer. So I went and made my prayer. Alhamdulillah. And I came back. And now I'm on. So again, I, I don't mind. But if I just get understand the context of what I'm doing, you know, I have a lot to discuss. I really do. Uh, this thing of social justice is in my heart. And I have a lot to talk. You're probably going to stop me. Say, Imam, it's enough. You're giving us too much. So, but let me just see what's going on, how I'm going to participate. Am I giving a talk? Or just, uh, just, just questions and answers? Just, just make me understand. So we're just discussing social justice in general this evening. Um, you know, as you know, Juneteenth is June 19, which is tomorrow. Um, and we're talking about social justice, um, you know, as it pertains to us as, you know, community members, as believers. Um, and so, you know, in the last 20 minutes or so, that's your time to do with as you choose to discuss social justice. I understand you have a lot to discuss. I do. I can't, you know, I can't. I mean, seriously, I, honestly, I want to, you know, I'm in it. I lived it. I, I still live it now. And I think that, you know, Muslims as well as all of us have an opportunity to do something. Let me just give you some context. I think a verse in Quran, just kind of see where we are as Muslims. Allah says, لَوْ شَعَرَ بُكَ لَجَعْنَهَنْ أُمَّةٍ وَاحِدًا وَلَا يَزَلُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ فُنَا If Allah had willed, He would have made us one people, one religion. Um, and, and He said, if that was His will, and they will never cease to differ. So we have like, you know, uh, two billion three hundred million Christians on this earth, and what one billion nine hundred million Muslims, uh, about one billion Hindu, five hundred and three million Buddhists, and um, and about maybe maybe eighteen million Jews. In all of us, you know, this is our faith tradition. We, we all of us, you would say, every one of them would say, we should fight for justice. And we agree. All of us agree. In fact, if you go to a Harvard Law School, and if you look at the entrance of the of the faculty library, is a verse from Quran. They call call it one of the greatest um, expressions of justice in the history of the world. All you believe stand out for justice um, for, as witnesses for Allah, even against your own selves, or against your parents, or against your near relatives, against the rich or the poor. So Muslims have a mandate wherever we are stand up for justice and i, I want to just give um you know let me just give a, a moment to think about something that happens whenever something happens on a global level i really think about it and and i want to think talk about um george floyd for just one moment just one moment and there's a tradition every muslim knows it uh that the prophet peace and blessing be upon him uh he said that um beware of the supplication of the oppressed, right? So there's no barrier between it and Allah. And, and in one tradition it says, 
even if the oppressed is a disbeliever. So we as Muslims, we don't oppress anyone. We don't say, well, you can't oppress us because we're Muslims. No, anyone who's oppressed, we should fight against it. And uh, one tradition that if, if the people of the world understood and appreciated, maybe I'll take another three or four minutes, is that okay? Three or four minutes? If, if, if you know, if we would appreciate it, uh, the prophet peace and blessing be upon him, he said, help your brother if he is oppressed or if he's an oppressor. And the man said, yeah, Rasulullah, I help him if he is oppressed. How do I help him if he himself is the oppressor? He said, stop him from the oppression. Let me give you a practical example with George Floyd, right? Um, Chauvin, Derek Chauvin was convicted. Three convictions, he's facing up to 70 years in prison because of what he did to George Floyd. 70 years in prison. And this is just state charges. He's also facing federal charges. Now, the interesting thing is this. You say, you're my man, you're my friend, you're supposed to support me. Yes, I support you by stopping you. Here, Allah give us a practical application. Those three officers, they didn't put their knee on the neck of George Floyd, but they watched. And you know that they're charged also? They're facing, they're facing charges. They're facing, uh, um, I think, this month, if I'm not mistaken, state charges and federal charges, they can get as many as seven years in prison. Why? Because they put his neck? No, because they watched, they did nothing about it. We as Muslims, whoever the oppressor is, even if it's another Muslim, say, no, no, we, we ain't going for that. We're not going for that at all. So I think my major message is this, is that stand up for justice. Whoever it's against, a male, a female, a black, a white, Allah don't care about our, you know, our colors, our ethnicities, our race, and stuff like that. And this is why Sir Isaac Newton said that I can calculate the movement of the stars, but not of the madness of man. We're going crazy right now. So we got a lot of work to do. Muslims, Christians, Jews, together, all of us, uh, to protect ourselves, protect our planet. Thank you so much, Imam Siraj. Again, I'm sorry for sort of putting you on the spot then. <laughs> um, I, I will, I would like to come back to you, Okay. Um, give you some more time, certainly at the end, sort of as the culmination of our discussion this evening. Um, very quickly, I would like to go to Imam Safwan. Um, but before I do go to Imam Safwan, I have not, you know, welcome to the community, but I haven't given um, his due right in terms of um, reading his bio. So if I could just take a quick minute to do that. Imam Safwan Aid is the son and student of a renowned Islamic scholar and theologian, Dr. Imam Talal Aid. Imam Safwan graduated with his master's degree in Islamic studies and leadership from Bayan Claremont School of Theology. Under the guidance of Sheikh Jihad Brown, he wrote his thesis titled From Ijma to Ijtima, towards the development of institutionalized Ijtihad in North America a model of consensus building based on the lex lexical method methodology of Imam Malik's famed book of jurisprudence, al muwatta He also holds bachelor degrees in economics and women gender studies from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and is known for his advocacy work in economic reform and social justice. There's a lot more here that I could read about Imam Please Safwan. Please don't go through the whole, you don't have to go through the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> but I do want to say, Imam, for those of you who may not know, Imam Safwan is our, 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 our new Imam. So we're welcoming him to our community. We're throwing him into the deep end, so to speak, by asking him lots of questions about difficult subjects. And hopefully, inshallah, he will be patient with us. Imam Safwan, um, because um, because our, our, oh no, I, I, it looks like he may have fallen off again. Oh no, Imam Siraj fell off again. Inshallah, he finds his way back. Um, well, because Imam Siraj was kind enough to answer um, our brother Tahir's question, um, I would like to ask you now my question that I had sort of come up for you. Um, so my question for you is, essentially we have so many areas of concern, I think just not just in America, but all over the world, right? So 
there are areas of social justice with respect to gender, there are areas of social ju justice with respect to race, there are area of areas of social justice that span the globe, the likes of which, you know, we don't have time here to get into every single uh, societal ill, right? Um, so I, I often encounter people who seem like, you know, if you say, um, I'm concerned about the nature of the way that Black people are treated in this country, or I'm concerned about the way that Palestinians are being treated. Their response is essentially, yeah, but what about fill in the blank other people who are also suffering, right? And so I struggle with this because, you know, in my mind, our hearts have enough capacity for concern for all of these social ills, for all of these problems. Um, and I would ask you, what would you say to that? What would you say to someone who says, yeah, but what about the other thing that's going on that's also really horrible? The other thing that's also really oppressive, the other people that are also really struggling, what about them? What would you say to that? MashaAllah, that's a good question. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Um, Alhamdulillah, you know, we, we thank God um, for all of his blessings and for instilling us with the fitra, which is the inclination towards oneness, right? That we all have this inclination, not only towards his unicity, his divine unicity, but also towards the unity of all human beings. And we as human beings, from a theological perspective, we call ourselves a nafs anatiqa, right? Which is the rational soul. So the rational soul is built upon the idea of objective truth, right? And in objective truth, there's many things that we can build from this, right? The fact that we all come from a woman's womb, right? The, so this shows that we have a common origin, right? That we have a common ancestry. From a theological perspective, we are all contingent beings who are in need of one another and in complete need of the creator. And so this idea or much of it, right? Especially when we want to go back to white supremacy, right? And it's wing colonization, right? And, and we're living in a post-colonial world that's still dealing with many, uh, or we could say the remnants of colonization. Right, and, and so there is no doubt, right? Just as Mandela and, and others have echoed, right? That for instance, any concept of whether it's the Palestinians or whether it is um, African-Americans, right? Here in America, dealing with slavery, dealing with incarceration, right? Which is kind of a, essentially a newer model of free labor, essentially slavery, um, that all of these things are dealing with the fact that a human being can believe themselves, right, to be superior to another human being, or their cause can be superior or more noble, right, than another human being. So part of number one is to affirm this idea of humanity, right? That even in the Arabic language, the word insan, which is a human being, comes from the word uns, right? Which means uh, comfort and serenity, right? We have a word in the Arabic language, um, adami is someone who is a very gentle, kind, right? Um, dignifying 
a soul that makes others feel dignified around them. So, which is Adami is from the word Adam, right? That we all came from Adam, right? So we're all Adamites. Um, and so this, once we actually begin to realize and accept that we are truly, right, brothers and sisters, um, and although this, this may seem like a very much so a, a cliche, um, but this is really at the heart of our problem is that even in bigger cities, you know, uh, you can walk by so many people and nobody will even look at you. No one will even acknowledge your existence. You know, this is a declaration right? That when you walk by another human being and don't even say hello, you're acknowledging, right? That I could care less about what happens to you. I won't even acknowledge your existence because that's another human being, right? That I have to care about and interact with and talk with. So the very kind of social contract that we exist in today is one where we make people earn dignity. We make people earn respect. We make people have to earn an acknowledgement of existence. Rather, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he said, greet those you know and those who you do not know, right? So this idea of greeting people and the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him said, can I tell you something that will make you love each other? After salam, right? Can I tell you something that will make you love each other? Say salam, say peace, say hello to people, right? So the way I see it is that universality, right? And, and of course, I'm sure once again, this is a very basic concept. Universality, right? Starts with embracing the particular and embracing right the complex and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran right وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ, and from his signs as in the signs of which how you know him is the creation of the heavens and the earth right وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ right and the difference in your colors and the difference in your languages. And then he says, there is a sign in this for those who have knowledge, right? And so those who have knowledge of the unicity of the world and the unicity of all people coming from a single source, they begin to see complexity as a celebration of his oneness, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even when he speaks about the bees, right? He mentions that the bees, they eat from different fruits, but then, or they, or they, they may eat from the same fruit, or an animal may eat the same thing, and produce something completely different. مُخْتَلِفًا أَلْوَانُ And so here also this, this idea where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nahl is talking about the bees where he's saying that you may do the same things but the shifa, the healing, is a different product or a different thing. And so to, to your original question, what this means for us, right, is this idea that we can all pray, we can all make dua, we can all, we can all do our prayers, our remembrance of God, right? We can all read our scripture, we can all give charity, we can all do different things, but the ways in which we have an impact on society can be completely different. So when we talk about solidarity, it's not that I need to be the main activist on Palestine, 
it's that I need to be in solidarity with the main activists in Palestine. My focus could be, for instance, here with prison reform. But if I have a network of solidarity with different activists working in different places, right, then we can avoid this whole conversation about what about is it, right? What about Palestine? What about Syria? Right? So I can be an activist in a specific place, but then I support someone who's working in that specific field. So that way we are able to address many issues, right? Within a network of people with each person, right? Taking their different roles. And then when they ask, right? When they ask us to come together, right? When they have a call to action, that's when we all support and focus on one thing. And I would say that part of that issue is a crisis of authority. So there's one person we're all supporting, for instance, but in social media, that's, that's not how it works because if you are just sharing what other people do, right? There is a sense of, um, that, well, I, I can produce it too. Right. So there's this kind of crisis of authority that no one wants to do. Um, no one wants to take after the other one, or no one's willing to humble themselves to another person, right? Which we can talk about that for hours. And that is also a, a great issue uh, when it comes to, to activism is the unwillingness to network, the unwillingness to have solidarity. Why? Because I got to do it all, all by myself. And so in reality, you have a bunch of people who their efforts can be reduced to basic virtue signaling because they have to spread themselves so far Right? And they have to spread themselves so, so thin. So in the end, they have very little impact. Right? So actually what needs to happen is I'm focusing on my thing. You're focusing on your thing. We have solidarity. We have a network. And that way I can go into right, that issue deeply. And nobody would need to say, oh, why didn't you say something about this issue? Why were you silent? That's, that's the other issue. It's like, if you don't say something on social media, then it's like, you didn't say it or you don't care, right? So that, that's also the issue with, with activism today is that people just assume just because you're not on social media, that means you're not doing anything. Um, or that means you didn't speak out on it as if that's the only platform to do so. Um, so that's kind of one of the, also the issues of incoherence um, as well. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to go on much longer, but I would say that um, any idea of universality, any idea of consensus building is dependent upon people upholding those definitions, right? And in Islam, even we have a concept beyond legality, right? Um, and, and one of our awa'id, one of our uh, legal maxims is this idea of, for instance, you know, I was, I was thinking about a particular one, but I think I'm going to go with another one. But the, the idea of our, our legal maxims, right? that, that hardship begets uh, facilitation, right? And so the more strenuous a particular topic is, then that means that it deserves, in a sense, a greater facilitation. And that can also come down to kind of culture, right? One of our legal maxims is right? the, the culture is an, an arbiter. Culture is decisive. Um, and so universality also is like, well, if we, you know, one of the issues we see in the West is, is that 
if you keep trying to universalize, for instance, liberal democracy, but there may be people in other places of the world who like the way that their government is, or maybe it would be more harmful to introduce something, right? So when we try to universalize too much, we also can become ignorant of the particular needs of society. So um, there's a lot I have to say about that. But anyways, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much. This is a broad topic. So I commend you all for being able to be as concise as possible. Um, I know that that's difficult. So I apologize to you for that. Um, no but I will say thank you so much, Imam Safwan. Um, so much of what you're saying speaks to my heart, which is essentially that, you know, we have the ability to support multiple causes, even if we have a focal point or an area that we that we can essentially focus on. And then that is a part of the network of social justice. Um, and in doing so as a community, we can uh, uplift so many more causes than if we just burnt ourselves out trying to run around supporting, you know, every cause that came yeah. that fell into our lap. So um, I, I, I appreciate you for, for saying that. Um, I would like to uh, go back to our beloved Imam Siraj, who is back, alhamdulillah, he's, he's back. I'm so excited that he's here. Um, I will quickly introduce, introduce him. Uh, so in 1969, Imam Siraj began his journey to Islam with the Nation of Islam. Later, he transitioned from the Nation of Islam to the Wardeen community and then to his own community. He established a mosque in a friend's Brooklyn apartment in 1981, and soon after the congregation purchased the space of an abandoned clothing store for what would become Masjid al-Taqwa. Uh, Imam currently leads daily prayers and performs the Friday sermon at the Masjid. He also conducts full days of teaching in Islamic studies, Arabic, and marital counsel counseling. And this is, you know, one of my favorite parts about his bio that I'm about to read next. In cooperation with local police, Imam Siraj led the local Muslim community in an anti-drug patrol in 1988. The community staked out drug houses in Bedford Stuyvesant in the cold of winter for 40 days and 40 nights, forcing the closure of 15 drug houses. The effort which fundamentally changed the character of the neighborhood by reclaiming the area from drugs and crime received high praise from the New York City Police Department and international attention from the media. Imam Siraj, I'm I don't, I don't even know how to sort of welcome you into this area of social justice because this is so much a part, as I understand it, of who you are and what you work toward. Um, there are so many areas of social justice that you have attacked personally, physically, on the ground, not just, you know, my generation likes to have you know, tout social justice from behind the computer. Uh, not that there isn't value in social media, social justice, but you know, there's certainly a difference in um, being able to dismantle 15 drug houses physically <laughs> than posting on Instagram. So Imam Siraj, if you are there, I would love to welcome you to just um, sort of give us a little bit of give us some hope about where we need to be moving in terms of social justice, because I'll be honest with you, it has been, you know, it has been trying for the last few years, for the last few decades. Um, it's trying to look at humanity and the areas in which we need to support each other better and to fight against oppression. And it's exhausting to realize that we live in a world where the types of injustices that occur, um, they occur on our watch, right? Humanity is watching other parts of humanity do awful things to each other. And we have to, uh, we, we, we will be held accountable for our actions. Um, so Imam Siraj, if you're there, um, I would love to hear your thoughts um, specifically about where we go from here. It's just so much. Um, it's it's exhausting. I'm I'm weary from it, and I'm. And Don't worry about it. We good. 
Don't worry about it. We're going to be good. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Honestly, well, I have to that. I'll tell you why, right? You know, Martin Luther King Jr. said, and he was quoting from uh, an old reverend many, many years back. He said, the moral arc of the universe is long. It's long, but it bends toward justice. You see, what we have to do, two things we have to be. Number one, we have to be hopeful. That, yeah, it's difficult. I get it, right? But it was difficult for those who came before us. You know, there was one prophet, Noah, as you know, according to the Quran and the Bible, he was he taught for 950 years. 950 years. We only been on this planet. I don't think you've been on this planet 100 years. Am I correct? You have not been, right? Okay. 950 years. And by the way, they said he had about 80 followers, 80 followers. And the prophet Muhammad said that some prophets had one or two followers, some had none. So that's the first thing that it's that the the results are in the hand of Allah, but we have to you know we have to we have to make effort. Mankind can have nothing except what he strives for. Let me give you one example. And every time, every once in a while, there's something that happens on the planet that captures everybody's attention. I am very uh, impressed with Nelson Mandela. Very impressed with him. Unbelievable. Uh, um, when he died. Five days after his death, they had a memorial for him. And listen to what I'm going to tell you. Five days, right? Head of state. At this point, he's the head of state. Do you know many, how many heads of state, present heads of state, attended his memorial? 91. 91 heads. I mean, I'm talking about presidents, prime ministers, premiers, kings, Muslims, Jews, Christians, everybody. Why? Four presidents of the United States at one time. President Clinton, Obama, Bush, and Carter was, was there. 26 congressmen, 26 people from Congress were there. Why? Why? You know the, logistic, the logistical problem getting 91 heads of state? into South Africa? Why did they come? Because of what this man did. What did he do? He was in prison for 27 years. I got an opportunity when I went to South Africa to go visit the prison that Nelson Mandela was in. Now every year, hundreds of thousands of people go to the prison where Nelson Mandela was. I went to Soweto, to his home, and walked to the home of Nelson Mandela. Why? Because this man stood for justice. Let me tell you something interesting. I don't know if you know the, uh, about South Africa. Less than 2% of the population of South Africa are Muslims. Less than 2%. Yet when Nelson Mandela established his government, two people interesting who he put in his government, in his cabinet. Number one, called Dula Umar. His real name was Abdullah. They called him Dula. He was the minister of justice, the first minister of justice. How ironic. And then the um, chief justice, Muhammad Ismail, a Muslim. A population less than 2% Muslim, yet when we look at the cabinet of Nelson Mandela, you see all of these Muslims. Why? Because standing up for justice. And I think it's an important point. I just caught a little bit what the imam was saying but I think it's important for Muslims to appreciate uh, relationships. Uh, I got this from our, our Ibrahim Rasul. He was the ambassador of the, of the uh, South Africa to the United States. And he told me how important it was to have coalitions, you know, um, alliances. Um, and you can call them what you want to call them. But I think this is the point that Muslims have to understand. Sometimes we can work with people behind a common goal. Let's say justice for, for, um, for Floyd. That's the goal. Or maybe prison reform. So when we talk about coalitions, partnerships, whatever the case is, nomenclature, I don't, I don't care about the name, but the thing is, sometimes I can't uh, um, join you on principle. 
that that's just the way it is. I said, you know what? I can work toward this issue, but I can't work toward that issue. And I think Muslim ought to be honest. You know, we should be honest like that. We don't have to be afraid to think that every time there's a cause, we should be there. We should be there in principle. Anything we 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 agree with the principle and justice. We got to we got to deal with that. But I'm a Muslim. Some things I can't do, and I have to be I have to be honest about that. So um, I, and in my conclusion, I you know I love this I love this struggle. The moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. You know, just just keep working hard. Uh, I remember one time, uh, uh, 19, I think 1988, uh, it was a Wednesday night, sitting in my office, we had a Nakika, one of our brothers, Brother Salim Abdul Sabor and his wife, they had a child, so we had a celebration. And I'm sitting in my office, and I'm preparing my sermon for Friday, this is a Wednesday. So brother says, Imam Saraj, there's someone here to see you. I said, send him in. Um, brother named Mahir, uh, and a Muslim, I think from Palestine, he came in my office, he was crying. He says, you know, Imam, I, I own a building and the drug dealers took over one of the apartments. I called the police and they could do nothing. Can you can you help me? And I said, give me a moment. Uh, I was preparing the topic, help ye one another. I had wrote it down on my paper, help ye one another, right? And um, so I spoke to the brothers. I said, I think we should do it. And um, I made a decision that night. Either we were going to help him. If we're not going to help him, I'm not going to give that that topic. I'm not going to give that. I'm not going to be a hypocrite, right? So we decided to help him. We took about 25 brothers. We went there. I went with him and knocked on the door, and they said, "Who is it?" I said, "It's the Muslims, and we come to take back our apartment for our brother." I heard the drug dealer there. The, the leader said to his people, "These are Muslims. Don't do anything stupid." So they came out and they left the brother's place and the brother got his place back. I'm saying that we should do what we can do. I don't, I don't advise everybody to do, do, do that. I don't advise every brother to uh, per, person, every city to close down drug houses. I don't advise everybody to do that. Alhamdulillah, we have brothers who, who you know, who Allah bless them. Study the martial artists, you know, martial art, artists. Some of them were in prison, tough guys, ain't afraid of nobody. So, in other words, the bottom line, if you're going to do it, do it for Allah. That's the key with me as a Muslim. You do it for Allah because Allah ordered it. He demands it. And finally, I'm going to read something from you. One of my favorite, um, um, if you would, teachers, Arnold Toynbee. Arnold Toynbee was the greatest uh, historian of our modern time. He's a British historian. And um, he, read a, he, he wrote a book. Uh, would you like me to tell you the title that you may want to read it? Hmm? Would you want me to tell you? Okay, let me tell you something about the book first. It's called The History of the World. Um, 12 volumes. You can handle that, 12 volumes, right? But, but, <laughs> 7,000 pages, 3 million words. Okay? So he says some profound things. Let me tell you one of the things he said. And it's very interesting because he's not a Muslim. He ain't got no horse in the race. He's a, he's a historian. And listen to what he said, I quote, the solution to all international conflicts lies only in embracing Islam in mass because Islam is the only religion that can transcend nationalism. I see with great dismay that nationalism is gaining grounds even among the bearers of the Quran. I will hope for the day when all humanity will break this idol and unite all as the children of, of God. So this is what it's all about. It's about God. He doesn't look to your bodies nor your forms. I'll be honest with you. I, you know, as a black man in this country, it's still my country. I love America. This is my country. I ain't going nowhere. You know, I've been, I've been all over the world. I've visited, you know, I've been to Mecca. I've been to Medina. I love Mecca and Medina to visit, alhamdulillah. But my country is America. This is my country. And I want to see it flourish. I don't want to see it, uh, you know, destroyed. And right now, we're in a very, very precarious situation right here in America. You know, and so we have to all get together and say, you know what, we have to make this country work.
make it make it better. It's not perfect. And I think that we ought to we ought to recognize that. And we have to tell our leaders, we have to be honest with our leaders. We have to call them out. So no, no, Mr. President, I disagree with you on that. You know, and you know, don't fear man, but fear Allah, the Almighty, because in the end, we're answerable to him. We have to answer to Allah. That's what makes us who we are. You know, the most popular name in the world is Muhammad. But the Prophet said the most beloved name of Allah is Abdullah, Abdul Rahman, the servant of Allah, the Almighty, because we are worshippers of Allah. So we gotta get busy, we gotta work together with everybody, put our hands, you know, together and fight against injustice, even if it's against ourselves. Mm. We gotta stand up for justice. So that's my my very small contribution, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much, Imam. Thank you. Um, Thank, special thank you to Vicar Brandy. She actually sent me a message. She had to go um, around 9:50, um, but she she you know said thank you to everyone for having her here, and you know we were grateful to hear her um, remarks. Um, I know that Isha is soon to begin, uh, so I want to thank you all for joining us this evening and for your um, amazing comments um, and for bearing with us with technical difficulties. Um, inshallah, you know, I look forward to the next event where we can discuss hopefully more of this, right? Hopefully yes. this is the end of the conversation. Hopefully these are conversations that are ongoing, inshallah. Absolutely. And in person, too. In person, inshallah. inshallah. Okay. All right. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Wa alaikum salam tala. Wa alaikum salam tala. Wa alaikum salam tala. Take care, everyone. We'll see you soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, ma'am. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.